Here we go. Um, first thing I want to do is hand back some homework. Uh, I have students, uh, Bianca Monis through uh, Genesis Nunez. Come on, get down and get your homework. Bianca Monis, are you here? Come on, come on down. Come on, everybody from MO through uh, NU. Come on down, get your homework. Bianca Monis. Uh, Jane Morrell, is that you? Logan Mongal, Gina Musia, Gina, uh, Matt Myers, Olivia Nagy, Max Nevin. Max, is that you? Hurry up. Christina Nguyen. Christina. Kelly Nguyen. Oh, you're Kelly? Okay. Emma Niven. Emma. Genesis Nunez. Okay, that's all I got. Uh, huh? No, I, I, I got everybody. Um, I'll get the rest of you guys on on Monday, uh, on Wednesday. Yeah, I just have the ones that I did. No. M O to N U. M O to N U, so just a few names. I only had L M N, so I read the last half of it. So don't worry, we'll get your paper. You know. All right, let's begin lecture. We're going to record this. Um, does any, is, there, is there anybody here that's really good at Windows Media? You know, movies and stuff, Windows Media Player, stuff like that? Because I, I recorded this thing Friday, our lecture. We had a shorter lecture than normal. And I, I rendered it at 480p instead of 720p. It took over an hour for this computer to render it into a video. I was astounded. Boy, I, I, this is the only one I got. It's a piece of crap Windows machine. Oops, that's in the, that's in the YouTube. <laughs> because of, all right, get your clickers ready. Uh, I want to point something out to everyone based on the grading that I did for homework six. We had a couple boxcars, boxcar X, boxcar seven. The second task was to calculate the um, interaction force vector on boxcar X. And the way to do that was to use the momenta before and after the interaction. Now here's the initial momentum for boxcar X, uh, and most of you got that part right. After interaction, it had a lot less speed. So this little blue arrow it should be even smaller than it is, but 
304 kilogram meters per second. It was really going very slowly. It lost almost all of its momentum. Yeah, we don't have to do anything today. You ready? I can hear you from all the way up there. Well, are you? Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Yeah. You ready? Good. You nod your head? Good. All right, good. All right, so we have these two momenta. Delta P over delta T is going to give you your, your net force on that part of the system. And it's going to be mirrored by the delta P over delta T for boxcar 7. But I asked you about boxcar 6, or boxcar X. So. so here's your delta P. Now, this is a place where uh, many of you uh, bollocked up. Uh, because you, you started uh, dropping minus signs. And those of you that just got your exams graded or your homework handed back, I, I took, took off a point or sometimes two points um, for a lot of students. So there's some sevens and some sixes where there should be eights because you mishandled the minus signs improperly. Both of the momenta are positive for boxcar X, but in the boxcar 7 part of the calculation, it had negative momentum and negative velocity or leftward. And many of you did not do that correctly. And I venture to now those of you that didn't get aren't getting graded by me, you're going to probably get a pass. But for those of you that are getting graded by me, you're going to get dinged on this a little bit. All right, so this should be a leftward uh, change in the momentum. You've slowed it down. It had a ton of momentum uh, to the right. Now it just has a little bit of momentum. So, um, so that's a, indicates. And th this is an example of where if you if you mind your subtractions and your directional minus signs, excuse me, and keep them distinct you'll avoid a lot of headaches, all right? And you won't, you won't make a mistake. All right, so you take the delta P subscript X divided by, oops, I forgot a subscript for the new uh, numerator of that fraction. Anyway, delta P subscript X divided by delta T, 0 0.07 seconds, gets you to two significant figures, uh, 21,000 or 210,000 newtons leftward so that it needs a minus sign there or it needs the word left all right and so you get a you know and i saw a few of you write in your vectors you didn't have to uh, some of you put in little diagrams of the box cars and stuff that was good so uh similar calculation and depending on how you round off your delta P uh, for number seven, you know, you might not get exactly uh, 210,000, but to two significant figures, you get the same amount of uh, net force uh, on in the rightward direction. And this one's positive. And this one's positive because delta P subscript X is a little bit of rightward momentum minus some leftward momentum. Most of the momentum of boxcar or before the interaction the boxcar number seven had like negative 14,400 kilogram meters per second in other words to the left now when you put that in a delta p you're subtracting a negative that means you're adding so you you, you basically have an addition masquerading as a delta and if you do but if you do that correctly divide by 0.07 uh, you get the same figure uh, to two significant figures of round off. All right, so just a, a word to the wise on that. Um, 
For those of you that were in my group, uh, last names L uh, through M, uh, I still have your papers up here. I'll be grading them tonight, handing them back on Wednesday. So I posted some of the homework, six grades. We still have homework four and f three, four, and five to do. Uh, and I think I probably won't get to that until during the spring break, but maybe this week sometime. All right. Questions about this homework assignment? Okay. Now, let me uh, give you a little bit of instruction about elastic versus inelastic, which I asked you to read over the weekend, chapter 8.4 and 8.5. Uh, the whole thing about elastic and inelastic, they're related terms. Um, elastic is an idealized situation. Inelastic is a continuum of states. Perfectly inelastic is an idealized uh, opposite uh, state to elastic. So, uh, but they're all about the change in the kinetic energy during an interaction. Um, so one half MVF squared minus one half MVI squared. Now I have a clicker question for you. Go ahead and get your clicker turned on. And let me just make a general announcement. I. I I caught up on a lot of messages that you guys sent me. I don't know. When was the 25th? That was last week. Today's the, what, the 4th, right? So today's the 4th, 3rd, 2nd, 1st. So 25th, what was that, Monday? Yeah, after the fiasco of... So I think for those of you that are, are really still worried about your clicking, I think I've got it roped and, uh, and uh, squared away, but I'm still stuck with this Windows computer uh, and all my, uh, most of my data is on my uh, MacBook Pro, which is in the shop for repairs. And those guys over there, they couldn't tell me when they're gonna get it done, so. I was hoping to get it back today, but. But I'll be updating that, it might be later this week, because I think I've got the, there was some person in here that had four I clickers registered to their name, and one of them was not correct. And it was, and it was it, for some reason, we couldn't correct it. So what I did was I just deleted the entire roster and then resynchronized it. And then when I did that, I had like about three students that weren't registered, and I, and those are I think students that never come to class. So uh, I think I think we're squared away. On I clickers. All right, here's the question. A collision is inelastic if, go ahead and vote. This is basically a vocabulary question. Okay, 10 seconds, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, uh, correct answer. Uh, let me get this out of there here. This trackpad doesn't click for beans. It's driving me crazy. All right, there's your answer. And here's an important point. 
The homework six boxcar interaction was definitely inelastic, definitely. Uh, it was... Uh, um, the... the uh, in fact, I worked it out. I don't know. You, probably, you guys probably didn't work it out, but I worked it out. Uh, the kinetic... The sum of the kinetic energies before was about 19,000 uh, joules, and afterwards it was about 10 joules because they were just poking along at 0.03. So that's about three centimeters a second. It's like an inch per second, five feet per minute. So it's, it's not exactly uh, uh, inspiring for speed, but it's definitely uh, an inelastic collision. Now the textbook authors make the point that elastic, which is where kinetic energy is preserved, um, is an idealization, except when we study subatomic systems like electrons bouncing off nuclei and stuff, protons bouncing off nuclei, you know, being repelled by the nucleus of a, you know, of a gold atom or something like that, some big heavy nucleus. Um, you know, matter of fact, for about the past hundred years, what year is this? Nineteen, but the past. 120 years, we've been studying nuclei uh, and, and electrons doing exactly that, and protons too, um, definitely uh, bouncing off the nuclei of heavy atoms like gold. Gold is an interesting substance. It's a metal, right? But you can pound it. It's very ductile. And you can pound it so thin that you can actually see through it, and, and yet it's still solid. It's not very strong. It's very flimsy. You have to handle it with delicacy, but it's very thin. You can see through it. And so what they, you know, about 100 years ago, there's a famous scientist named Ernest Rutherford. And you'll read about, you, you'll learn about this in Physics 2054, no doubt. And what he did was he, he sent the, um, a radioactive uh, source of something called alpha particles, which we now know are um, the nuclei of helium atoms, two protons and two neutrons bound together. He didn't know that at the time. But he knew that they were positive and that they were small, and he sent them and targeted a gold foil. And we still do the same experiment today. It is very difficult to do. Uh, but it's modeled on inelastic collisions uh, of the alpha particle as it goes to the foil and being repelled by the positive nucleus of the various gold atoms and being repelled once. If it's a very thin foil, and if, if, the, you know, if the dimensions are right, and you've got all the speeds right and everything, you can model it as if there's only one chance for it to bounce before it passes through, and it's, you know, it's on its way to the detector. And so uh, they were able to do that and, and study based on perfectly elastic collisions between alpha particles and gold nuclei. And we still... Um, we still use that view in subatomic physics, you know, in nuclear physics. Uh, but, you know, something like a boxcar is, you know, it's not going to be, it's not even going to be close to being perfectly elastic. And why is that? Well, if you've ever been to a freight yard or even listened to a, a freight train go by, you know that the boxcars, they make a lot of energy or they make a lot of noise. I mean, they make noise on the, the track, you know, clickety-clack railroad track, and the engines are loud up in front, but the, the rail, the, the, the box cars and the rail cars, uh, when they collide, like in the homework six problem, uh, they generate a lot of sound energy. Also, the latching mechanism is not something that, you know, you could latch with your bare hands. Okay? And I don't even think ten of us Ten of the strongest people in here could latch or unlatch a box car without like some big tools, you know, like crowbars or something for leverage. Uh, and so it requires a lot of work to latch or unlatch box cars. And so that that energy, you know, was originally stored in the kinetic energy of the box cars, and a good fraction of it went into latching those box cars together in this example and into the sound energy. Now, sound energy is very inefficient. Okay, it goes off in all directions, 
you know, you can't channel it like a laser beam unless you have very, you know, very special acoustic setup. Uh, so it just willy-nilly makes, you know, it dissipates energy in all directions. And uh, so, uh, you know, so this boxcar picture here, you're always going to see some degree of inelastic um, uh, collisions between them. And for every other macroscopic interaction. Now, you could say that the moon and the earth We're interacting, but you know, there's there's a little bit of frictional drag on the moon. Do you realize that? What what do you think is the source of the frictional drag on the moon? What's that? Solar wind. Solar wind. Well, yeah, solar wind, but so the, the thing about the solar wind, yeah, the solar wind is going to impact the moon deposit a little bit of momentum, but not a whole lot. But there's significant momentum transferred to the moon and back uh, from the Earth. Think about it. What is it about Earth that has a significant magnetic fields? But the moon's not magnetic. It's not a magnet. Right? I mean, theoretically, yeah, that could happen. But what, you know what, what would happen is the, the, uh, the rocks and the moon would align with the magnetic field, just like the rocks of Earth align with our magnetic field. You know, all the little iron molecules would align towards the north and south poles. The tides, the tidal interactions of Earth with the, the oceans of Earth uh, slow down the moon and... You know, if you've ever wondered, yeah, why is the moon always facing us? You know, why is the same side always facing us? You know, they, they call it the uh, the uh, the dark side of the moon. You know, the other, but it's really the other side. The other side gets plenty of sunlight. You know, during its orbit, you know, half of its orbit, it's, it's getting a good amount of sunlight. But the the side that's facing us, the man of the moon, is always facing us. And that's because we're tidally locked. The moon and the earth are tidally locked. And so you can say that even in that interaction, you're not, it's not going to be perfectly inelastic. Although it takes zillions and zillions of years for, the, for a satellite like the moon to get tidally locked and synchronized uh, on its orbit. So its orbit is always facing the earth uh, but it did. It wasn't always that way. It's it slowed down and it, its orbit changed, and its spin angular momentum changed a little bit as well. We haven't talked about spin angular momentum yet, but uh, we will talk about that in the coming. Well, probably after after spring break. All right. I want to talk about this next topic: gravitational potential energy. Uh, and. A way to think about potential energy or gravitational potential energy is, you know, you're you're up on top of the library with a water balloon or a, you know a football, or, you know whatever you're going to drop, and you put it on the ledge and it's just sitting there. It doesn't have any kinetic energy, but it took jewels of work for you to get, you know, to carry it up the stairs and stuff, you know. So many joules of energy to go up against the, the force of gravity. You know, because gravity wants to send it downward. So if you go up, you have to have a little bit more newtons, you know, to go upward. Uh, so, uh, so you've done some work to get it up to the top of the library. But yet, if you lean it on the, on the ledge there, and before you drop it, you don't have jack. You don't have kinetic energy at all. It's just at rest, right? But it has the potential, when you drop it, to develop kinetic energy after a few meters of drop, a few meters of free fall. So, you know, you could think of gravitational potential energy as uh, drop energy, the energy that you have available as soon as you drop, you know, the water balloon over the side of the library. Now, here's another system with a lot of gravitational potential energy, GPE. Uh, that's an infrared false color image 
of, uh, I believe that's Atlantis, the space shuttle Atlantis on one of its last. Um, and it's, it's false color infrared. So the, you can see the nose, the leading edges of the wings, and a little bit of the tail uh, section. And that's backed by the, the, uh, you know, the, the rocket engine and the back end of the, the space shuttle. Uh, they're so hot, they, they have a different color. And so the space shuttle's up on orbit. Now, the thing about when this, go ahead and make a note. When the space shuttle on its orbit has got an orbital speed of about 18,000 miles an hour, 17, 18,000 miles, somewhere in there, depending on what its orbital height is. All right, but up at its normal height, you know, 200 miles or so, you're talking about 18,000 miles per hour. Plus, you have all that altitude. So if you are on top of a library 200 miles high, you know, and you dropped a water balloon, well, that water balloon would have a lot, well, you'd hit, you'd hit terminal velocity pretty fast, but, but I mean, theoretically, if, if there were no air, you know, you'd, you'd have a lot of kinetic energy by the time you hit the ground from 200 miles high. So at this, and this is on reentry, so it's not at 200 meters at this point, but it's got a lot of potential energy, and it's also got a lot of kinetic energy. Now here's the thing, go ahead and make a note of this. The landing speed at, uh, at you know, at, out here at Kennedy Space Center for the uh, shuttle is about 200 miles an hour. You know, they want to bleed off as much speed. So that's why they, they when, when they come into the atmosphere, they come in nose up. The, the angle of attack is, you know, positive, you know, 20 degrees or whatever it is. And that's so that they can catch more atmosphere and slow down. And they get really hot when they do that, which is why this thing is glowing. So they dissipate energy on the way down. They have a ton of kinetic energy and they have a ton of gravitational potential energy up there. And they want to land at about 200 miles an hour. Right now, for us, 200 miles an hour, if we had a car that could go 200 miles an hour, which I don't think anybody in here has a car that can go that fast. But I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because if you, if you did raise your hand, you'd be admitting to, uh, you know, a traffic infraction. <laughs> and I know, I know you don't want to come close to admitting anything like that. But anyways... I, I venture a guess that nobody in here has got a rig that can go 200 miles an hour. But for the space shuttle, that's like, you know, that's like me walking across from my office over here. You know, just take take about 10 minutes to walk from the physical science building over here, just like Grandpa Jones. And so 200 miles an hour at the shuttle landing strip is zip zap for kinetic energy. But when it hits the, the landing strip, it doesn't have any more drop potential. So what we would say is sea level at the landing strip, the gravitational potential energy is zero. So go ahead and make a note. On orbit, gravitational potential energy is maximum. You know, assuming you're on a nice round circular orbit, which is, the space shuttle does plenty of those, I guess. Right, 200 miles up or whatever it happens to be. But then by the time you get down to the landing strip, you have zip potential energy, max, kin but, but you don't have max kinetic because you had a lot more kinetic energy up on orbit. But you're all kinetic. You, should, you can say that. The only energy you have is kinetic for the space shuttle. Now here's a picture. This is a picture taken from the from uh, the space station. Uh, this is Atlantis on one of its, I think it's re-entering. So it's going from the bottom of the screen over the horizon towards the top of the picture. Uh, on it, this is its last re-entry, supposedly. Uh, and what they do is, and this is taken when the space shuttle's over Australia. All right, so what they do is they deorbit over the Indian Ocean and, you know, they go into the nose-up attitude. They start catching they start catching air resistance, basically, way up there. And then they fire their retro rockets and stuff and try to slow down a little bit. And then eventually they flatten out 
and they start they start dissipating energy. And you know what they do? That what they do is they're 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 coming in um, through the Indian Ocean and then up by, by Australia. They're curving back northward and they're heading for Hawaii. And so they're going so fast, like this this picture here, uh, Mach 13. That's approximately 10,000 miles an hour. So they're really blazing. And so they go into an S turn, you know, somewhere over Sumatra. And by the time, you know, so they're going into a couple lazy S turns at 10,000 miles an hour, and starting down in Indonesia somewhere. And by the time they have one of them done, they're almost to Hawaii. Then they do another one and they head for California and then just, you know, kind of ease on down through California, Texas, and, and down here to Florida. Or maybe a little bit shorter than that if they're going to land in California. Uh, question. Um, so is, is air resistance a form of inelastic momentum? So you're colliding with the air? Air resistance is. It's a, it's a non it's like friction and it dissipates heat. And so anytime you're dissipating heat, you're losing energy into the atmosphere. So, you know, the, the energy is not destroyed. It's just redistributed, but it's not, you can't recapture it. It goes into the atmosphere and you can't really recapture it. I know that energy changes form, but is it, is, is inelastic and elastic collision the only possible way to obtain other forms of energy? Like it's just, it's no, it's not at all. I mean, it, you know, collisions are... You know, collisions are, you know what collisions are shorthand for? Uh, electromagnetic interaction. You know, this nice rigid tabletop here, you know, where you can go like this. Silencio. Did your parents ever say that to you? I remember my mom, silencio, when we were making noise upstairs. But, you, you know, this thing, it's, there's nothing magic about it. It's just electromagnetic interactions. You know, the, the molecules are bound together in the surface and in the, it's, you know, the plywood, it looks like. Um, and they, they're bound together, just like the crystals of uh, H2O in a snowflake. You know, there's hexagonal structure. And if you get enough of them together, you have a chunk of ice. And the chunk of ice is solid. And it's held together by those intermolecular forces that basically the hydrogen bonds... You guys know what hydrogen bonds are? Yeah, you better. I bet you guys know a lot more about them than I do. Anyway, so that H bond in there, that's, that's what's holding them together. That's for ice. And other stuff over here, you know. I don't know what kind of chemical bonds. But, but it's all electromagnetic. You know, everything... You know, your food calories. Calories are, is a unit of energy. That's all electromagnetic. You know, and you guys know about ATP and ADP and all that stuff. Like, isn't there something called the Krebs cycle? Maynard G. Krebs. So, uh, those, and, and that's all electrical. I mean, chemistry is all electricity. You know, basically the outer, ele the valence electrons of one atom having conversations with valence electrons of the other atom or the gaps in the valence bands. So here we, we have the, the space shuttle, and these are three different versions of it. And you know where this was taken? Here's another nice thing about this. This thing's way up there, right? Way up there, you know, halfway, halfway up to, this is about uh, 100 miles altitude. And you know what we got? It's, it's not a fancy plane that's looking at this. It's, it's a Navy P-3 Orion. A Navy that's got a special t infrared telescope on it, but that's about it. Nothing fancy. They don't fly that high. Matter of fact, the Navy P-3 Orion is, is designed to fly low and slow for hours and hours chasing Russian submarines. And we've got thousands of them. And they can all do this. And this one is designed, the, the one that was observing this is a missile defense P-3 Orion, you know, part of, the, part of the Navy's ballistic missile defense system. And we've got thousands of these babies. Don't mess with the U.S., my friend. So anyway, so here's this thing. We got a lot of energy. Now, here's the... Now, here's that. It's... 
You can see it's smoking. You know, it's, it's burning, you know, it's causing a lot of smoke in the atmosphere. It's vapor, you know, it's vaporizing a lot of atoms. Here's your basic principle. Work done on an object against the gravitational force, in other words, carry it to the top of the library, goes into stored energy, i.e. potential energy. Right? And so that would be gravitational potential energy. But atoms, you know, the energy levels of hydrogen, you know, all the H bonding and stuff like that has to do with electromagnetic energy levels. Uh, if work is done on an object in the vicinity of Earth, the resulting gravitational potential energy, denoted P, PE subscript G, uh, by the textbook, I always call it GPE. It can be thought of as a potential energy put into or gained by the object or a system. So nothing is, is um, there's no vacuum. You know, you're up there on top of the library, and okay, you're up there, and you got a water balloon, and you got drop energy available as soon as you feel like dropping. But if you don't have a library, you know, you don't have jack. You're still down on the ground floor. So, uh, so that's the thing, the object or Earth system. So the water balloon or Earth system. If it's lifted a height h, the gain of potential energy relative to Earth is just mgh. Now, this is not true for the space shuttle because the space shuttle goes a little bit higher than this formula applies. This formula, MGH, applies to uh, anywhere from the bottom of the Marianas Trench to the top of Mount Everest, roughly, All right? Because G is the same. But G out at the, at the level of the space shuttle orbit's a little bit smaller. Gravity's a little weaker out there, All right? Uh, but MGH for, for terrestrial objects uh, like, you know, water balloon on top of the, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the uh, library, yeah, MGH. And, and that's basically the opposite of the work done on the way down, okay? So, uh, so the change in the potential energy is MGH, uh, and it's very easy to calculate. Now... Let me add, you can add this to your notes. Write down MGH, change in potential energy, change in GPE, equals one half MD squared. All right, so you got MGH on one side and then one half M. So if your potential energy is completely converted to kinetic energy by the time you, just before impact, you have that equation. MGH equals one half MD squared. Now, you, did you write it down? Did you notice anything in that equation? MGH equals one half MD squared. What'd you notice? You can cancel M's. So what that tells you is something that we already knew: that the height and the speed. If you know the height, you know the speed. At least right before impact. And if you know the speed and impact, you know, one half mb squared and so forth, you know the height that it started with, you know, the top of the library. Now, when we come back on Wednesday, I'm going to go through, hopefully with my Mac, we're going to go through a whole set of calculations of potential energy. But for now, you're dismissed. Oh, if you want to come and get your exam one Scantron printout, I've got them up here today. Some of you were asking about that.